All right, welcome to the very last video. You and I are both excited. So let's end up by talking about what you do when your overall ANOVA is significant. So we found our omnibus test was significant. It was a large effect size. Now what? Right? And so we're gonna talk about post hoc tests and trend analysis. So why do I even need this follow-up test? Well, the F ratio only tells us if there is some difference somewhere. It doesn't tell us where. So we have to figure out where. And we'll need some additional tests to tell us where. So remember, just like regression, we get that overall, is my model important? And then we looked at the coefficients. This is the same scenario. Overall, is my model important? Let's start looking at group differences. So how do we do that? Well, we could do multiple t-tests, but if you remember the beginning of this lecture, I told you that was bad and you shouldn't do it. Well, we could still do that, but we had to find some way to control for type one error. We could run what are called orthogonal contrasts or comparisons. Okay. This is generally hypothesis driven. I only wanna compare one, two, and three. I don't care about four, five, and six. Okay. They're often called a priori tests meaning they're planned in advance. Okay. Or we could run what are called post hoc tests, okay, which are actually effectively either a t-test or an f-test, okay. but they're often considered a posteriori. They're not planned in advance. Okay. And this is where you compare every mean to every other mean. Now, this is the most common thing that people do because why would you have groups if you're not interested in comparing them? Okay. But practically, mathematically, this is similar to just a bunch of t-tests. So we have to do something for that type one error problem. And the last thing we can do is what's called a trend analysis. So trend analyses are where you um, test if that categorical IV that sort of has a continuum presents a linear trend, a, uh, a curvilinear trend, you can do you know, squared to the third, to the fourth, et cetera. And this would be similar to treating it as actually continuous, but it you know, holds to the fact that we know that these are grouped variables and not truly continuous measures. So trend analysis only makes sense when your IV has some sort of continuity implied. So in our case, it's no dose, a low dose and a high dose. So let's start with a more popular one, the post hoc test, where we're gonna compare every mean to every other mean. In general, we need to use some sort of stricter alpha to accept that that effect is significant to control for our type one error. Okay. Now the test itself, the math, is either a t-test or an f-test, kind of depending on which post hoc you like. So we're mostly gonna look at t because it's easier. The correction, so when people say they did a post hoc test, they normally mean they're doing a test plus a correction. And I think people get confused because they tell me they run a Tukey. I'm like, Tukey is not a test. It's not a statistic. It's a correction. <laughs> so the test, when you have someone says they do post hoc tests, they usually mean T okay, on pairs. I remember that T and F are equivalent when we're doing two at a time and some sort of applied type one error correction. Okay. So we could do no correction, which would be bad. We could do Bonferroni, which is very popular. We're gonna use that one. Tukey is also very popular. Student Newman Cools or the Sheffe test. Okay, Sheffe is the low man out. It's actually an F test. And so for all of these po post talks that we're gonna do, we're gonna use a T test to calculate if the difference is Calculate if the differences, there's an extra V in here, um, between means is, is significant. Okay. And so I'm gonna show you how Bonferroni works and compare it to no correction so you can see what's happening in that correction. Okay. And so Bonferroni is a special, and there's also the Siddock Bonferroni, is a special type of correction where it works better if you have a smaller number of comparisons. Okay. And so this works better with the less number of groups. As the number of groups increases, it becomes overly restrictive, meaning it's too controlling. <laughs> um, in that scenario, there's also one in R called the Holm test, 
which is a little less problematic. Okay. And what it does is it actually corrects P for you. Okay. If you were to do Bonferroni, Bonferroni manually, like my hand, what you would do is you say, okay, my alpha value is 0.05 and I have three comparisons, so divide. 0.05 divided by three, easy enough. What the computation of the computer does for you is it says, well, you have three comparisons, so we're gonna adjust your p-value for you. So I don't have to change alpha myself. I go, okay, well, alpha is 0.05 and it's correcting p based on the number of comparisons. Okay, that's two ways to tackle the problem. Either we don't correct P and we change our alpha. And so we're, we have to remember our rule is 0.017 or something. Or we let the computer adjust P and we leave alpha alone. Either way, there's an adjustment there. Okay, either we are adjusting our alpha or the computer's adjusting P. I personally found it easier to let the computer adjust P because then I could keep 0.05 in my head as the rule all the time. Um, but if I'm looking at someone else's work, I can't magically make be adjusted. So I um, could use an adjusted alpha. All right, so the bo Bonferroni, the way this works, the Bonferroni, <laughs> the Bonferroni <laughs> is that the overall alpha rate is just divided by the number of comparisons because we've already seen in our formula from the beginning of, of the class that it is the alpha rate is related to the number of comparisons. Okay. So it's easy to correct that problem, just divide. It's a relatively simple idea. And so if I have three comparisons, my new alpha would be 0 0.017, okay. 0 0.05 divided by, so it's 0 0.016 repeating technically. Now, again, I'm just gonna let the computer do this fixing rather than me. Okay. And so the output that we're gonna see using R here is corrected for that idea of a new alpha. So you can just keep regular alpha in your head. Okay. Some other comparisons that we could use is the Sidak Bonferroni, which is a slightly different alpha correction. The home test, which is a variation on the theme for Bonferroni. Done its test, which is only useful if you have control groups. Okay. And then there are even more, there are entire novellas on post hoc tests alone. <laughs> so there are lots of them. There's no one right scenario. I would say that done it is not used very often because it's kind of a little, it's specific to a specific research design um, and that Bonferroni and Holm are much more popular. So let's look at this in action. Okay. So what we do is instead of doing T dot test, we do pairwise T dot test. And while we could still use our formula, instead we're just gonna do this as, um, uh, for pairwise t.test, dot test, you put in the DV first, then the IV. You do P adjustment method. So this is none, this is a not, no corrections at all. So I can show you how, what's happening to the P values. And then it's still this t dot test. So paired equals false and var equal is true, okay, because Levine's test was not violated. And so it runs us a little table here and makes, <clears throat> excuse me, every pairwise combination. And I put that into a, um, a table down here for us to look at across slides. So low dose, dose versus placebo is 0.28, so 0.282. So that would not be significant. Placebo versus high dose is 0.008. Okay, low dose versus high dose is 0.06 or 0.07 rounded up. So this is what would happen if there was no correction. <clears throat> but we shouldn't do that. We should correct. So let's see what happens with Bonferroni. Well, it's the exact same code. You just to p just method equals Bonferroni. And be sure you spell Bonferroni right because I can never remember if it's two n's and one r two R's and two N's, I, it's often misspelled for me. So that's Bonferroni correct, correctly spelled. And now we can start to see what's happening. So 0 0.85, 0 0.03, 0 0.20. So this is where the adjustment is happening. So instead of me adjusting my alpha, 
right? And looking at the uncorrected numbers, it's going to go, you know what, I'm just going to fix P for you so you don't have to think that hard. And now we can see that we would make the same decision, but the, the P values are very different based on that correction. Okay? And so that is what the, what's happening, what's controlling for type one error. So when people tell you they ran a Bonferroni, you now know that that is a t-test with a correction applied on the p-value. Okay. They're not really running Bonferroni, they're running a t-test with a correction, but that's how people write these up. Okay. Now, because I've calculated every pairwise comparison, we could use ds here, which is our independent t1, to calculate the effect sizes for each combination. One thing I'm working on for Moat that hopefully one day this will be superfluous in this video is like actually adding in the code where you could do pairwise, but right now you gotta do them one at a time. And so what I've done down here is do them one at a time. <laughs> Unfortunately, this gets to be a lot. We have a bunch of them, so we're working on it, but we would run our means and standard deviations. Okay. And you would just plug in one versus two, right? one versus three, and two versus three. I put them in as um, all positive here because it doesn't matter which way it goes, the negative one is still that same effect size. But what we can see is only the largest effect was significant. Okay, we only have five people in each group. I mean, this is like ridiculously underpowered, right? We don't have enough people, come on now. But only the largest effect size was considered significant, but these other two are still quite large. So we need more people. Well, let's visualize this. This is still a one IV bar graph. Okay, so we've got all our cleanup code, right? Our uh, aesthetics X and Y, so we put the um, IV on X and the DV on Y. And this looks all the same as our t-test code here where we're just doing one bar graph. So we've got the mean and the confidence interval. And we get this kind of nice, beautifully made up data. Okay. Where placebo is the lowest, low dose and high dose, right? So we know that the only the difference between, oh, I forgot already, placebo and high dose would be considered significant. Now, one thing that can happen is if your study is underpowered, you could find a significant F test and no significant post hoc comparisons after controlling for um, type one error. Okay. Because the ANOVA don't care if you control for type one error. Researchers do because we don't wanna make a mistake, but mathematically it just says that one of these is probably different. So you can't have a scenario with either low power or low of small effect sizes where uh, the F test is significant and none of your post hocs are significant. It does happen because once you correct, it goes away. Um, that scenario, you should power your study better. Okay. All right, last part here, let's look at trends. Okay. Now a linear trend, right, is a line. We've been doing that with regression quadratic trend, this would be x squared, x cubed, a quartic trend, I don't even know how you'd interpret this nonsense, but um, is x to the fourth. Okay. So as many groups as you have, minus one is how many trends you can get. So we have three groups, minus one for degrees of freedom, right? Uh, so we can get a linear trend or a quadratic trend. So x to the one or x to the two. And when we do this trend here in a second, that's what you'll see. You will only get as many as you could possibly estimate. So I cannot estimate a cubic trend without at least three, sorry, four points. So one, two, three, four. Or one, two, three, and then up again, four. <clears throat> now, a quadratic trend is a curve across levels. Okay, it could be up or could be this way or <laughs> smile way. A cubic trend is two changes of direction and a quartic trend is three changes in direction. Okay, past that is stochastic and you should not be using these analyses. Okay. You can do more than this, but then it gets totally bonkers. So this analysis, remember, only makes sense with our somewhat continuous IV. It does not make sense for like uh, three different 
favorite colors. Like there's no trend, there's no continuum there. Hmm. All right, so let's see how we do this. Hang on, and then we'll come back to the top here. So K equals three, that's how many groups I have. I'm going to save myself a new IV as dose two because what we're about to do actually changes the underlying structure of that variable. And then it would, if, um, if we tried to rerun some analysis or run some new analyses using that variable, you might not realize that it has changed the underlying like information in that variable. Okay. So we're gonna say this is a new variable and then set this up. Okay. So the function here is we're gonna say contra.poly Okay, for specifically, this is a specific type of contrast, one versus two, two versus three, three versus four, to calculate this trend analysis. And we set the contrast for that variable. So as proof here that it does actually change the underlying data, pepperoni, pepperoni, t-test, graphics, here. Let's just run everything real quick like. So let's do a summary, oops, lowercase summary of our master data set, just real quick so you can see. I think it shows up in the summary. Don't quote me. So we can see the dose here is just our little group. And then we're just going to run, oops, that's power. Try again. Shwink, shwink. Okay. So now I have a, a second variable, right? dose two. And when you run this contrast piece, okay, it's not visible here. It does actually change the variable. So see how dose here is now listed as a factor, you know, from before. Dose two is a factor, but it adds all these attributes down here. Okay, contrast. So this is what's happening. It's changing this variable to include the contrast option. Okay. Do make sure your levels are in the linear or the whatever continuous order, because it will assume whatever order they're in is the one you want it in. <laughs> so placebo, low, high. If we had high, low, placebo, oh, that would work. But uh, we had a low, placebo, high, this would be in the wrong order. Okay, so make sure they're in the right order. Okay. Then we're gonna run the AOV function, which runs on ANOVA. Okay, it's the same thing as LM, it just gives you the output in ANOVA format. Okay. Libido is predicted by dose two and then show me the linear output. Okay. It says here's the line linear trend. And then here is the test for the quadratic trend. Okay. The linear trend is significant because this is nice clean data. The quadratic trend is not. Okay. Notice our F value is the same. This is the same test. Basically it's just testing if it's linear or quadratic um, instead of um, thinking about group differences. So remember, ANOVA math is regression. And da, 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 da. Um, you should get all the same effect sizes too. So what we would do is report that t-test. Okay, there's a significant linear trend, t. Right, what did I get 12 from? Don't forget 12 here, the degrees of freedom. And then r squared. Cool. Now to visualize a trend analysis, what we can do is switch this to a line graph. So this is a one IV line graph that's in our week four notes. Okay. And so it just looks a little different because we have a stat summary, we add the point, we connect the dots, right? And then we add the error bars. Okay. And I would only visualize it this way if I was doing that trend analysis. Otherwise I would leave it as the bar graph okay. because this implies that trend whereas the bar graph does not. Okay. Now, last but not least, I said you should power your studies better. So how do we calculate power for ANOVA? Okay. Well, specifically, um, we can use this power.ANOVA test. We could also use power.f squared, just because it's still regression. But there's another version here for um, one-way ANOVAs. It's okay, let's say we eta here was 0.46. I'm gonna convert that to regular F and not F squared. Why are they different? I don't know, I'm telling you I don't, but it's just regular F. So we do eta divided by one minus eta, take the square root. 
right, because a to the squared. And we fill that in here. Okay, the number of levels we're using is three. Okay, so this works for one way ANOVAs. N equals null, because I want to know what N I need. Sig 0.05, power is 0.8. And it tells us here, I need at least five people per group. How handy, since we had five people per group already. But we probably should have a lot more, okay, because we can't really totally have any assumptions about the normality of the sampling distribution, right, with such a small number of people. Okay, that's how you calculate power for effects, uh, power for one way between subjects and ova, which is the type of test we were just doing. And just don't forget, they warn you here, but don't forget, if the, if the question is how many people do you need, the answer is not five, it's five per group or 15. All right, so in summary, you have made it to the very end. Woohoo! Okay, here's what we've covered in this lecture. F statistics, more specifically, because we kind of glossed over this in the regression section. The logic behind ANOVA of our last signal to noise ratio. The overall or omnibus test, post hoc test, and trend analyses, followed with effect sizes and power. Okay. So visualizations and power. This is the whole kind of complete ANOVA package, okay. um, handling like all the different pieces. So congrats. Great job making it to the very end. And so now go take your final exam.